Imagine a city rich with culture and technology that existed thousands of years ago but now lies hidden beneath the depths of the ocean. This is the lost city of Atlantis, a mythical place that has captured the imaginations of people for centuries. Many theories have been proposed about its existence and its ultimate fate, but the mystery remains unsolved and people often speculate whether it was just a myth or in fact a real city lost in time. This week, we will explore the legends, the evidence and the ongoing quest to uncover the truth behind one of history's most enduring enigmas, the lost city of Atlantis. Red Room. I hope you're all doing well and ready for another edition of Red Room Revisits, the series where we take a look back on some of my favorite topics covered on my weekly podcast and see if there's anything I've missed or didn't have time to touch on. So since we're talking about ancient history today, I thought I'd bring you back on a little journey of my own ancient history to way, 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 way back when I was a little old college student. Now, as we all know, college consists of two things studying and socializing, one of which I was much more gifted at than the other. I'll give you a guess which, aka I talk for a living now. (laughs) Now, after a long night of partying, when I woke up feeling like a smushed up dehydrated piece of dog shit on the side of the road, there was nothing I loved more than turning on my favorite show and snoozing through the day, ignoring all of my academic pursuits. The show I watched and couldn't get enough of was Ancient Aliens, a History Channel special where they discuss just about any piece of history and somehow link it back to aliens. Look, it's the epitome of chewing gum for the brain. Now, ironically... (laughs) I was actually studying classics at the time, but truth be told, classics classes were more a necessity than a passion of mine. I didn't dedicate much of my energy to those lectures as they were just filled with genuinely some of the most intelligent and academic people I've ever surrounded myself with. And frankly, I panicked and I scraped a pass with major imposter syndrome. Truth be told, I've always had a fascination with classics, from their off the rails deities to the basis of their societal structure. I love learning as much as I can about ancient Greek and Roman cultures. Now this week, we're going to deep dive into the myth or a true story, depending on how you want to look at it. And you can let me know in the comments what you think of Atlantis at the end, maybe at the start of the video and at the end of the video, did I change your mind? But we're talking, as I said, the lost city of Atlantis, a place we first learned about from a little man called Plato. Side note, one of the only classes I did well in was my Plato class. Now, over the centuries, Atlantis has evolved into being viewed as a legend or kind of a kid's story, mostly thanks to Disney's 2001 adaptation. Iconic adaptation, I will add. But this week, I want to ask, is there any legitimacy to Plato's story of the lost city? I want to look at how Plato actually described Atlantis and try and notice any of the parallels between its retelling and other ancient myths and legends. Finally, I want us all to put on those tinfoil hats and speculate as to what Atlantis could have been if it were real. Was this a city that was just socially forward or could it have been a hub of futuristic technology, possibly brought here by advanced extraterrestrial species? Oh yes, we are going there. (laughs) I love talking about ancient cultures, so let's get into it. So, Plato. Who the hell was he? Here's a TLDR. Plato was an ancient Greek philosopher who was born in Athens during the classical period, aka the peak of democratic Athens. What we think of when we think of, you know, classical Athens. Plato founded something called the Academy, which was a philosophical school and where he taught what would later be known as Platonism. Platonism is the view that abstract objects are in fact real, despite not being tangible. An example often given is the number pi, because that exists outside of time and space, and it remains the same value unaffected by the actions or thoughts of humans. But we didn't come here to talk about philosophy today, did we? Absolutely not. (laughs) That's exactly about as far as my class in Plato will take me right now. Can you see why I preferred ancient aliens? 
Anyway, Plato is also known to have taught his philosophy through dialogues with his teacher Socrates and to be the namesake of Platonic love. He told the story of Atlantis around the year 360 BC in one of his dialogues known as the Crataeus and Timaeus. So, what did Plato say about Atlantis in these dialogues? So he claims that in ancient times, the earth was divided among the gods and claims gods treated humans in their districts kind of like how shepherds treat sheep, guiding them without force. He describes Athens at the time as an ideal, pursuing all virtue, living in moderation and excelling in their work. Now, Atlantis at this time was Daddy Poseidon's allotment. Apparently, Atlantis had a colossal temple dedicated to Poseidon in the center of it. The city of Atlantis was governed by laws inscribed into pillars within the temple of Poseidon. The pillar was made of a substance called orichalcum, which means of unknown origin. And he claims that orichalcum had been considered second only to gold in value and had been found and mined in parts of Atlantis in the ancient times. He tells us that orichalcum was so plentiful in Atlantis, the city glowed with the dazzling red light of the metal. Plato said that Atlantis was an advanced civilization that was prosperous and powerful, but gradually corruption crept into society and it became cruel and greedy. Plato got all his information of Atlantis from his relative Solon, who was an Athenian statesman, lawmaker and poet. He was known to be a man of great wisdom and character. He went to Egypt later in his life and was told of Atlantis from a high Egyptian priest who read the story of Atlantis from hieroglyphics to him, which also mentioned that Egypt was a colony of Atlantis. The story was kept in Plato's family for six generations before he published them in his dialogues. He described Atlantis in great detail. The founders of the lost city were half god and half human. They created a utopian civilization and eventually became a great naval power. The city itself consisted of concentric islands separated by wide moats and linked together by a canal running through the center of the city. Every passage to the city was guarded by gates and towers and a wall surrounded each ring of the city. The walls were constructed of red, white and black rock quarried from the moats and were covered with brass, tin and the precious metal or calcum respectively. The islands contained many precious metals which made the city unfathomably wealthy. However, people on Atlantis were not materialistic or blinded by greed. The city was home to rare exotic wildlife and measured 2,000 by 3,000 stadia, which is how they measured things back in Plato's day, which is around 300 by 500 kilometers. Apparently, it was a bustling city all day, all night, rich in languages spoken from all over the world, with natives being fluent in almost all of them. They eventually conquered Africa as far as Egypt and Europe as far as Italy, before being driven back by an Athenian-led alliance. Plato recalled, Atlantis ceased to wear its prosperity with moderation. When Zeus, Poseidon's brother and ruler of all the gods, saw how the Atlanteans were behaving, he was disgusted. Everything they once stood for had been corrupted. They had turned greedy and spiritually rotted. For this reason, Zeus and the gods, perceiving how evil this race had become, inflicted punishment upon them and let them be swallowed up by the sea of a great flood. Now, according to academics, Atlantis is merely a myth, a story where we explore topics like greed and how easily power can corrupt and how being materialistic can rot a nation. But today, we're going to be looking at the less popular theory in academic circles that Atlantis was in fact a real place. But before we go off the rails and start talking about ancient alien astronauts... (laughs) What is the evidence that points to Atlantis possibly being real? Plato's story of a city wiped out by a flood, powered by divine intervention, is nothing new. In the Christian Bible, we have the story of the Great Flood and Noah's Ark. Egyptian gods Ra and Sekhmet destroyed part of humanity for their disrespect and unfaithfulness by flooding the Nile. Ancient Irish mythology claims the first settlers of Ireland claimed to escape a flood, and Native American cultures have dozens of stories of catastrophic events. Almost every single ancient civilization has a similar story of a great flood. So many people argue, what is more likely? Every civilization making this up out of nowhere? Or was there some kind of great flood that destroyed a large part of our earth and its civilization? And if that is true, who's to say what it destroyed? 
Could it have destroyed civilizations that were way more advanced than we think our ancestors were? One of my favorite questions to ponder upon is what would survive now in a global cataclysm? Of course, much of our technological advances are tangible, like computers, but what about things like Wi-Fi or the internet? Could our means of communication be a mystery to a future civilization 12,000 years in the future? Graham Hancock is an author and an academic who spent years researching ancient civilizations. And he suggests that now with geology, we now know that there was a cataclysm around 12,000 years ago known as Meltwater Pulse 1B. Uh, Because when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I proposed that there had been a gigantic global cataclysm about 12,500 years ago. But I didn't really know what had caused it. I suggested a number of possibilities. And then suddenly in 2007, Out comes this hypothesis with mainstream backing by mainstream scientists saying that it looks like there was a series, not just one impact, but multiple impacts all over the earth around 12,800 years ago that, that, that caused this cataclysm. And I began to follow that theory. And by about 2013, it became clear to me that these scientists were onto something really big. He believes that this cataclysm buried dozens of ancient cities around the world that are yet to be discovered by archaeologists and that these cities could hold valuable information about the history of humankind. Independent researcher, former fraud investigator and army slash Iraq war veteran, what a combo, Jimmy Corsetti from the YouTube channel Bright Insight spends much of his time searching for possible locations for Atlantis. We're going to talk about his stuff in more detail later. He has speculated that the cataclysm was due to something called the Younger Dryas Climate Catastrophe, where global temperature shifts cause rising tides and global fires. This was said to be more destructive than the comet that caused the massive extinction event, the dinosaurs. So Atlantis? No problem. Now back to the Native American stories for a second. The Hopi tribe of Native America have a really interesting story of a great flood that has lots of similarities to Plato's Atlantis. The story says that long ago, the world was filled with evil. Men and women lost respect for each other and became greedy and selfish. The creator was unhappy about this and decided to cause a great flood to purify the earth. Then there's the legend of the lost city of Aslan, which appears across Aztec mythology as well as some Native American legends too. They consider it the birthplace of civilization and searches for the land of Aslan have spanned from Western Mexico all the way to the deserts of Utah in hopes of finding the legendary island. Now, although Aslan has never been physically identified, it has been described as an island. Rather than an island in the sea, it's an island upon a lake. According to the various Mexican versions of the stories, the homeland of Aslan was luxurious and a delightful place located on this large lake where everyone was immortal and lived happily among abundant resources. The land was filled with vast quantities of ducks, herons and other waterfowl. Red and yellow birds sang incessantly. Great and beautiful fish swam on the waters and shaded trees lined the banks. At Aslan, the people fished from canoes and tended their floating gardens of maize, peppers, beans, amaranth and tomatoes. But when they left their homeland, everything turned against them. The weeds bit them, the rocks wounded them, the fields were filled with thistles and spines. In modern Chicano culture, Aslan represents an important symbol of spiritual and national unity. Many of the same lessons are taught in this story of Plato's Atlantis. And I'm not saying Aslan is Atlantis, just so you know, far from it. But what if the Earth at some point was populated with these kind of cities set up this way? Some people speculate that humankind evolved far beyond our current historical beliefs, that Egyptians built the pyramids not to bury pharaohs in, but as some sort of energy source. Then there's the mystery around how they were actually built in the first place. Many people don't think the maths add up. Let's do a little calculation. Officially, the timeline is 20 years for the pyramids at Giza to be built. So let's presume they worked a 12-hour day, 365 days a year. The pyramids consist of about 2 million blocks, weighing anywhere between 1 and 4 tons. That would mean ancient Egyptians would have to move one stone every 2.5 minutes with some pretty basic tools to put it lightly. Remember, this is before the invention of the wheel, and man didn't have official access to materials like iron and steel. We also for years thought that slaves built the pyramids, which is now looking highly unlikely. Most archaeologists and historians today think that paid laborers built the pyramids of Giza, since deceased builders were buried in a place of honor. 
tombs close to the pyramids themselves, furnished with supplies for the afterlife. Archaeologists have also found remnants of laborers' facilities near Giza, and they were not slave dwellings. So if these people were on the clock and charging, would they really be moving one stone every two and a half minutes with their bare hands? Now, before you say it, I am not saying aliens came down and built the pyramids for us. Many feel that opinion is rooted in a cynical form of racism, since it could insinuate that African cultures couldn't build something as sophisticated as the pyramids without the help of extraterrestrials. After all, we don't really seem to have these presumptions about the Acropolis or even Newgrange. And trust me, I get it. But it has to be said, the pyramids are mind-blowing, and not just the Egyptian ones. Mayan and Aztec cultures built them, as did the Nubians of Sudan and the Babylonian kingdom built Zurat of Ur. There's even a pyramid in Rome. Why was this shape of structure so popular across the world, especially if we are to believe these cultures had little to no contact with each other? This is the kind of stuff that keeps me up at night, guys, if you haven't guessed. (laughs) But I'm glad to get my thoughts out there. Anyway, back to Atlantis. Where could it be? There are lots of fun theories surrounding the speculated location of the lost city of Atlantis. And to finish off the episode, we're going to run through some of my favorites. When I get to the one you think is closest to the truth, I want you to comment down below or vote in the Spotify poll, okay? Because we need answers and this might be the only way we get them. Theory number one, Antarctica is the lost city of Atlantis. Now this theory is pretty wacky, but I love it in a tinfoil hat way. It goes, the advanced civilization of Atlantis was located where Antarctica now is. When this global cataclysm happened, world temperatures dropped, resulting in a mini ice age. The poles shifted and Atlantis ended up down where the South Pole is. So instead of Atlantis being flooded, it was kind of flash frozen. And this is why we are yet to find any of its remnants. And now this is where we can kind of bring in another story that's kind of fishy. And then there's the diary of explorer Admiral Richard E. Byrd, who apparently came across an advanced civilization while flying over the pole in 1947. He describes an entirely different environment as he passed it, citing rolling green hills and temperatures of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. His diary reads, We are crossing over a small mountain range and still proceeding northward as best as we can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a small river or stream running through the centre portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. Light here seems different. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yes, there it is. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a large shimmering city pulsating with rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons of those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. Now, it should be noted that the validity of these diaries are dubious at best, but many people wonder if he came across some sort of passageway to Atlantis. Another interesting theory is that Atlantis is now what we know as the Rishat structure. This theory is mostly the work of Jimmy from Bright Inside, who we mentioned earlier. So the Rishat structure, I was on your show a little over a year ago and shared some details about it. To people who aren't aware, there's a location in the Western Sahara Desert of Mauritania called the Rishat structure. It's also commonly referred to as the Eye of the Sahara. It is a site that most people have never seen or heard of before, which is truly peculiar because it's so spectacular. It's a site that uh, astronauts typically use to reference from space. It is a geological feature that is said to be volcanic in nature. And what's so spectacular about this is that it just so happens to match more than a dozen striking similarities to what Plato had described as the lost ancient capital city of Atlantis. So this structure wasn't discovered until a space mission in 1965. It's located in the Sahara Desert and sometimes known as the Eye of the Sahara. And in case you didn't know, because I didn't, 5,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert was a luscious green forest and apparently home to some of the biggest lakes on Earth. It's located in Mauritania in northwest Africa, and the people of this land were once led by a king called Atlas. 
Herodotus was an ancient Greek historian and geographer who famously created the most accurate map of the world at the time. He shows Africa and marks Atlantis roughly around this area. Scientists can't explain what the Rashat structure is or how it was formed. However, a lot of mainstream scientists insist that it's some sort of natural formation. There are some really crazy similarities between the Rashat structure and Plato's description of Atlantis too. We had the three concentric circles in the ground, very similar to Plato's original description. The structure is the same size as Atlantis was described, 23 kilometers in diameter. The south would have been connected to the sea at the time. You can actually kind of see where that would have been on some of the satellite images. And there are mountains on the north side that lead to deep drops containing rivers. Obviously now this looks very different, but this land used to be luscious and green. And Plato said the mountains of the island of Atlantis were celebrated for their number and size and beauty. And he said this part of the island looked towards the south and was sheltered from the north. And you can see in the pictures, kind of adds up. Lo and behold, the Rashat structure is sheltered by mountains to the north, so I don't know, one too many coincidences. There is some geographical evidence that the land surrounding here was devastated by massive floods and tsunami. They found human remains and elephant remains here, which, you know, could hint at these exotic animals that Atlanteans apparently farmed. So going back to my point, like a lot of people see the Sahara Desert and they don't realize that this place was unbelievably different than it is today. And one of the things that's so important is that I know some people listening will, you know, they hear Atlantis, they think, oh, it didn't exist. Right. Whether it existed or not, the the evidence that we're going to chat about today to show you that there is conclusive evidence, I would say, that catastrophic water erosion, that the ocean had blasted through the Sahara tens of millions of years more recently than previously known. According to the science, 56 to 66 million years ago was the time of the Trans-Saharan Seaway, which was the last time the ocean blasted through it. However, there are a few lines of evidence that say otherwise. It's a point I've made many times, but it's really worth making because archaeologists roll their eyes every time you say the word Atlantis. But that is precisely the date that Plato, which is the earliest surviving reference to Atlantis, that's precisely the date he gives for the destruction of Atlantis. 11,600 years before our time, he puts it this way, that his ancestor Solon visited Egypt. And we know about that visit, it's historically recorded. That visit to Egypt was in 600 BC. And there Solon claimed to have been told by Egyptian priests about this great advanced civilization that once existed, but that angered the gods and was destroyed in an enormous flood. And Solon asked those Egyptian priests, when did this happen? And they said, oh, 9,000 years ago. Well, do the math. That's in 600 BC. That's 9,000 years before 600 BC. We call that 9,600 BC. That's 11,600 years ago. That's exactly the date of the end of the Younger Dryas. And it's exactly the date of what is called Meltwater Pulse 1b one of the biggest single rises overnight in sea level that ever occurred. So if Plato made it up, it's really weird that he picked a date that is precisely a date that coincides with the latest geological evidence on cataclysmic sea level rise at the end of the Ice Age. This is my personal favorite theory as to where the hell Atlantis was. Other theories are that it was the Minoan civilization of Crete, but the timeline doesn't really add up there. Others suspect it could be the submerged city discovered just north of Cadiz in Spain. And in fact, there's dozens of sunken cities across the world. Who's to say there weren't many Atlantises? Let me know your theories on Atlantis. Do you think it was real? Do you think it was all myth? Or do you think we'll ever find it? Have you ever heard of that Rashat structure before? If you haven't, I will link some videos below and you should really dive into it because it's mad. It is so crazy. Subscribe if you haven't already, guys, or follow on Spotify so you don't miss next week's episode. I'll be back very soon. I'll talk to you all next week. Bye.